It's good to see everyone out today. Amen. Everybody excited? Everybody looks like they're ready to... Have you got your Bibles? Do you have your Bibles? If you do, I'm going to have you turn with me to John 15. John 15, as we've started off the new year, I've tried to share with you several elements of Christian living that are important. We talked about making sure that we're reading our Bible daily. We talked about knowing the, the, the will of God. We talked about the importance of prayer last week and five conditions for answered prayer. These are all fundamentals to the Christian faith. Wednesday night we were reminded about the importance of walking in love, 1 Corinthians 13. And um, today I just want to share with you one more fundamental as we enter into the new year. And I, I say this as we begin because I really want to see each and every one of you succeed in the Lord. I want to see you grow in the Lord uh, this year should Jesus tarry. I want to see us be the people that God has called us to be. Walking in, in victory, and I'm not using that term just as a throwaway line. You come to church and everybody talks about, oh, yeah, we have victory and all that. But I mean genuinely have the peace of God, have the strength of God, have the help of the Lord, know his presence is with you, growing in him. Uh, I, I want that for each and every one of you. I know there are many conflicts in our lives. I know there are a lot of things that, that I'm not even going to say many of us, all of us are going through. That, that's, that really is life, again, not to be, um, you know, just to be flippant. But it really is life. In this life and in this world, we will have tribulation. That is a biblical fact. We will go through times of trial. But James reminds us, as do others in the scriptures, that these trials can strengthen our faith. We want to run from them. We want just the mountaintop experiences. But oftentimes we have to come down into the valley. And we are here, and God wants to work both through us, but also just work on us. You know, we're, we're on that potter's wheel, aren't we? We are the clay. He's the potter. He's rounding us into shape. He is doing something in our lives and in our hearts. And I want to remind you of a very important element that goes along with prayer and staying in the scriptures and all of those things today. And so um, John 15 is where we're going to camp out. John chapter 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and I'll read through verse 6. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Today, with the Lord's help, I want to talk about an important principle that we all need to embrace. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's happening, and you can say this person, that person, and these things are real. We live with other human beings. Sometimes people hurt us. We go through difficult, dark places. But regardless of all that, if you are the Lord's today, if you are a part of the kingdom of God, born again of his spirit, God is pruning you. He is working on you. And today I want to speak about God's pruning process in believers. There is a pruning process that goes on for each and every one of us, and it is for our good, and it is for the glory of the Lord and his kingdom. And so with that said, let's bow our heads and let's pray and ask the Lord to give us open hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. 
We are so blessed. We are so overwhelmingly blessed. We have your eternal, your word in written form given to us. Lord, all of us in here in our own language, we can read your word daily and you speak to us through your word. We have the very words of Jesus that he spoke while he was on this earth. We have this passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. On the night of Jesus' betrayal as he spoke to his disciples, and not to them, but to us also, some 2,000 years later, to every person that is a part of the body of Christ down through the centuries, Jesus has spoken, and we have his words, and we thank you. I pray today that you would... Give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears that are able to hear and discern and understand what you would say to us today about this pruning process, that we would understand and recognize the simple yet important truth that is found here in John 15, that we might both grow and be uh, victorious in our Christian life for your honor and glory. We ask all these things in the name of of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen Amen. and amen. So here in John 15, we have a very simple illustration written to a people in Israel 2,000 years ago that were very familiar with agriculture. You could say that it was an agricultural um, uh, society in many ways. And so they would understand this most simple of illustrations that anyone that was a farmer or tended or had any Uh, association with the growing of uh, fruits and vegetables and things of that nature, they would understand this parable. And although it is very simple, I want you to know how powerful and important it is. Jesus says, I am the true vine. For us, maybe living in Florida, we have citrus So we have oranges and tangerines and all these things. So we could just say the trunk of the tree. That is the illustration. Jesus says, I am the trunk of the tree. It is through particularly my roots and through the trunk of the tree that I have that I provide you as the branches with life. Through the roots of the tree, through the trunk of the tree, branches are able to have life. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So our Heavenly Father is the one that takes care of the tree. The tree, in one sense, is all believers. It is the church. It is the, it's the people of God. In another sense... It is also spoken to us individually, and I think we can gain something from that individually, but certainly corporately. The Father is the one that takes care of the church, and he takes care of you and I as, in, as individual believers. So he is, Jesus is the vine or the trunk of the tree. The Father is the one that takes care of the tree. And then he says, he speaks to the branches, verse 2. Every branch... In me, you know, if you're taking any kind of notes or you, got, you underline your Bible or anything, in me is very important. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we're not talking about a rogue tree or something that is out there that is not a part of the body of Christ. He is speaking of his body. He is, it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the Father takes away. So if you have the picture of a tree, you have that element to it, and you're looking at the tree, there are some branches that, for different purposes, they die. They're still attached to the tree, but they die. If you're a good farmer, you don't allow those dead branches to continue to be there and to create uh, suffocation issues or other issues with the branches that are bearing fruit. You want to get those off, and so... Jesus actually says, any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, the Father lops off. He prunes that. He, takes, he cuts that branch off. There's something very significant there for us. That's not really the purpose of my message, but we should all take that to heart. We should take that seriously. God will actually cut branches off the tree. I'll just let that sit there for a second. Then he speaks to believers, or those that are attached to him and are progressing, I'll say it that way. And every branch that bears fruit, that's the progression, 
He prunes it that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus speaks of two types of branches, the fruitful and the fruitless. We want to be fruitful. Can I just tell you something? God has ordained each and every one of us to actually bring forth fruit for the glory and the honor of his kingdom. That fruit can be found certainly in our witness, hopefully, our life and our words measure up to what the Lord says and other people hear and receive and come to faith in the kingdom. Hopefully that happens. That's a part of bearing fruit. We are getting the message out. Someone got it to us. Someone was faithful and told you and I about Jesus Christ. It's our obligation. As Keith Green said, this generation of souls, we're responsible for that as this generation of believers. We've got to continue to carry the message on. So that's a part of being fruitful, is getting the word out, and hopefully, Lord willing, seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. But then another way that fruit is available to us, we think of certainly in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. You and I are obliged to live um, a life that glorifies God and to grow in that, just as these trees grow. So... Sister Marion told me about a, a tree that she had when it was really, really little, and it's grown up now to about four feet tall, and she's cared for it and was tender with it. And when one of these freezes came through, she was like, I'm going to take care of this tree and do what I need to do to protect this tree. This is the, the type of relationship the Lord would have with us, but he wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to, to live out the life of Christ. So, uh, portions of our life that do not measure up with the example that our Lord has said and others have set, those are the things that we had to say, Lord, work on me. I know I have this flesh that is always screaming out for so many different things. But Lord, I also know that you have called me to live like Jesus Christ, that others would see and others would believe. There are too many as I was speaking with another sister this morning, that they've turned their back on Christianity because when they look into the church, and I'm not speaking just our church, but the church world, all they see is hypocrisy. And they see and hear people talking a talk, but not walking the walk. Jesus says, if you're in me, you should be bearing fruit. And so God wants us to bear fruit. There are fruitful and fruitless branches here. And the branches that never produce or quit producing fruit are those who no longer have life coming from the trunk of the tree. And this is the point. If you get nothing else, get this. The Christian life is not just, and there's a great, wonderful spiritual book that was put out a long, long time ago called The Imitation of Christ. And there's much truth there. We should imitate the Lord as believers. Amen? But there are too many people that think the Christian life is solely about trying to imitate Christ, and they miss the key point here in John 15 and really throughout the remainder of the scripture, which is life does not come to us because we decide to clean up our own act. Life comes to us as we are attached to the life giver, and that is Jesus Christ. You and I must be in relationship with him to receive that life that we might bear fruit. If we, are not, if we are not in right relationship with him and we are not receiving his life, the trunk of the tree, how can we as branches possibly bear any fruit? Go to any tree you want to and break off even a healthy branch that has a, and put it down on the side of the tree and see if it can... Well, I'll put it in close proximity to the tree. It will still certainly bear fruit, will it not? Well, I've, I've broken it off, but just, you know, I've, I've shoved it up right next to the tree. And so the trunk of the tree, so I'm going to put it right there. It'll bear fruit, right? No, it will not. It has been severed from the life giver. The trunk of the tree gives life. The branch has no life on its own. Can I get an amen on that? It quickly shrivels up and dies. Today I want to talk about the pruning process, what the Lord does on those healthy branches. I trust each and every one of us are healthy branches. You say, Pastor, I'm not. I'm not bearing fruit. Well, if you can say that today and recognize that, there is still hope. God does not quickly give up on the branches. He will do everything he can as the best 
farmer, husbandman, as, as uh, my version says. He will do the absolute best on his end and give us what we need so that we can begin to bear fruit. But there's, a little, there's one little sticking point. As opposed to a branch on a tree that really does not have a free will of its own, you and I do. So there is a cooperative experience here and situation that occurs. We have to be willing to follow the Lord and let him lead and let him give us that life. Amen? And we make that choice each and every day. But the Lord, because of his enduring love, the Lord's desire for us is that we bear fruit. The branches that are completely removed, I will say to you quickly, correspond, I believe, to the sifting. There's a sifting going on today. Folks, please do not take this lightly. Please hear me today. This world is as wicked and evil as it has ever been in terms especially of its ability to have its tentacles everywhere. I don't want to jump on this hobby horse and stay there forever, but I want to say to you again, as I reminded you a couple of years back, the internet and social media and all these things have opened up the floodgates. Back in the 1930s, there were Christians who were like, what's this thing called a radio, the 20s and the 30s? Uh, that thing can bring some bad elements into Christians' lives. And there were some Christians that, I, I don't even want a radio. Then TV came along in the 50s and 60s, and there were Christians that were like, hey, I don't even you know, want that. This was before the advent of, of any kind of Christian television, which, by the way, most of that is no good either anymore. But you know, if there were some good to it, before that, they were like, this is no good, and Christians didn't want that. We have gone so far beyond all of that. Now, at the touch of a hand, in your phone, your tablet, wherever you're at on your computer, you can pull into your life the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You can pull all these things in at an alarming rate. And you can do so in the privacy of your own home. Used to be years ago. If someone had a desire to sin, I, I don't mean to be crude, but if some man just said, you know, I'm going to go and cheat on my wife, well, you had to get on the horse and buggy and ride into town and take that long, no, no, this is, this is for real. Think about this. And take that long journey into town and then walk to the house of ill repute or whatever. And, and, and all these, there, was, there were all these elements where you had time to think about these things. Now, we don't even have to leave our homes. People can just at the touch of a button see and correspond and do whatever they want to do. This is what I mean when I tell you in 2023, we are at the zenith of Satan is, is thrilled right now at all the different ways that you and I can be tempted and sin is right at our disposal. It is beyond unbelievable. And most of us, we've seen this in our life if we'll step back. We're often captives to the moment, but if we would stop and step back and think back 10, 20 years, whatever, and much longer for some of us, we would see the change and how much easier it is now for sin to be prevalent. And when that happens, we become fruitless. And when that happens, there is a sifting that takes place. Right now in the church world, there is a great sifting that is going on. Truly, Jesus is standing at the door. He's returning quickly. And I have seen more believers fall away from the Lord in the last few years at an alarming rate. And, and we, some of us that have been around, we've seen this 30, 40 years ago. We were seeing what we thought was a sifting. That was nothing. That was a drop in the bucket. It was nothing compared to what's going on today. God is doing a work where, and he says that he will always begin judgment when it comes. Where does it start? Always begins in the house of God. I don't, I'm not going to bore you. All the scandals, all the things that are going on regularly, regularly, even in the so-called church, the visible church. So much evil, so much wickedness that goes on. God is, is doing a sifting work. He's going to see 
who are really his and who are not. Oh, well, he already knows our heart, but there's a sifting work that has to be done. And God is doing that work today, and branches are being cut off. They're being cut off, folks. This is what's going on. This is serious. I, 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 I can't be more sincere with you and serious with you about what's happening today. And the branches are being cut off. That's the sifting. But to those that respond to God's call, to those of us that say, I still have a heartbeat, a desire. I'm attached to him. Lord, help me to bear fruit. God says, I do a pruning. And this is what I want to share with you today, really. And that was a long introduction to begin to share with you verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Why? That it may bear more fruit. Just three quick things I want to share with you today. First of all, I want to talk about the process of pruning. How does God prune us as children, as his children? What does he do? How does that, what does that look like? I want to share with you the process of pruning because God uses at least three different things to prune us. Number one, God uses, get ready, this is going to shock you. God uses people to prune us. He will use that. That can be his shears. You know, when we think of pruning and we think of someone taking the, the shears and, and cutting some of the dead stuff off, God will oftentimes, in the process of pruning, use people. To prune us. What does this involve? Well, sometimes it involves, believe it or not, the ugly and the mean things that people say to us. Now, I know you're shocked because none of us have ever experienced that. I've certainly in the ministry, you know, 35 plus years, I've never experienced anyone saying one mean thing to me. So this is all theoretical. None of this is, but let's just cover it anyhow. God will oftentimes use people that can say some of the meanest, nastiest things that we would say that is so untrue and so wrong. God will use that to prune us and to help us grow in him. Number one, if we move through those experiences, we go and we retreat to the word of God. Lord, you know my heart. You know what's going on. And we retreat to him, which is a good thing. It, it, it strengthens our faith. It encourages us. We begin to worship. I think of David as he was fleeing from his son, Absalom, and he's the rightful king, but he's fleeing from his son, who's basically won the hearts of the people in Jerusalem. And as he's fleeing, there's a gentleman that sees him running away, and I'm making a long story short, he begins to hurl curses at David. And one of David's faithful men is right there and says, uh, let, this guy is like a dead dog. He has no reason talking to you like this. You want me to go up there and just chop his head off? Really? Because what he was saying was wrong. It was not true. It was a, it was a curse being thrown on David. You're getting what you deserve. Look what you did to Saul, and you usurped Saul's kingdom. Not true. God installed David. But anyhow, let me go up there and just silence this guy real quick, David. David says, no, let him talk. Because who knows but what God will look down and return a blessing to me this day instead of his curse. See, God will use even the mean and the wicked and the evil things that people may say to you or people may do to you. God will use that as an opportunity to prune and to work in your life if you'll allow him to. But that means we have to step back and say, okay, God, like Jesus, Jesus was truth manifest in the flesh. He is God manifest in the flesh. All of the Pharisees, all of the people that came against him at his trial, it was wicked, it was wrong, it was an illegal trial, everything that could go wrong, but yet did Jesus sit back and say, oh, I'm going to get you. I could, you know, for each and every one of you guys that are here, I can say what's right in your heart. I can start blabbing about all the evil, wicked things that you've done. I can, he could have done all of that. He didn't. He was silent, like a lamb going before the slaughter. There are times where God says, let the people talk. I'm going to prune you. I'm going to work on you in the midst of all these things. And oftentimes, these are people themselves, that they don't have the fruit of the Spirit. We're not talking about godly counsel. We're talking about sometimes even wicked men. Do, does God use wicked men and women? Yes, he does. 
And he sometimes uses them to help us, even though what they meant for something bad, as Joseph said, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So God will use people to prune us. Not only that, God will use, get ready for another one, problems to prune us. He not only uses people, he uses problems. Sometimes those are problems that we bring on ourselves. Sometimes there are things that we say, you know, I would love to sit back and say to each and every one of you, you know, it's the devil that has just made me gain all this weight. It's not me, Lord, you know, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, yeah, I like Krispy Kreme donuts, but that's not the problem. It's the devil. So we like to say that, don't we? It's everything is always the devil's fault. We're like Flip Wilson. I know that's a, a reference too old for many of you, but... You know, the devil made me do it. No, 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 no. Sometimes we bring the problems to ourselves, and then after we recognize that we've done this, hopefully we wake up and we say, oh, but God, can you use this for your glory and honor to, to move me beyond this? Yes, he can. And yes, he will. Aren't you glad for that? I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that we don't have to sit in the mess that we sometimes make, and God will just say, as we often do, just sit in it. That's the bed you've made. Now you're going to have to lie down in it and sleep in it. I am so thankful that if we come to the Lord and cry out to him, that God will even hear us as we have fallen five, six, seven times, and God will say, come on, I'll pick you up. Let's start the journey again. The Lord will do that, but he uses problems to prune us so that we might be more fruitful. And then sometimes the problems are those that come from the outside that are beyond our control. Pastor, I didn't, I didn't mess up. Somebody else did. A situation, a circumstance. Look at the, the turn in the economy, whatever it might be. I lost my job. All these different things. The circumstances of life. But God says, trust me, believe me. I will help you. I will bring you through. Just keep following me. Keep your eyes on me. And that's the great thing about problems is that problems can direct us back to the Lord. As long as our hearts are soft. Amen? Amen? And then, of course, God uses pressures to prune us. So he uses people, he uses problems, and he also uses just the pressures of life. And the key to the pressure and to the circumstance that you're going through right now is not the other person. We often see the pressure and we say, now, God, if you would change that pressure valve, if you would change that person or that problem, that pressure, whatever, to change that, and then I'll grow and I'll be fruitful. I'll be doing great. But what God often says to us is it's not about the pressure. Listen to me, it's about our response to the pressure. It's about our response to the pressures of life. Can I just share something with you? This is what I have found in life, in my own life, and I've seen it in other people's lives. Problems and pressure can either make you bitter or better. There's only one letter difference between the two, but it's all the difference in the world. The pressures of life can make you better. God is using that to prune you that you might bear more fruit. Lord, I don't know why I have to put up with this employee. Why do I have to put up with this? That? Yeah. God is working on you. He wants to do something in you that you might bear more fruit. If ever anyone could have said, Lord, the people, it's Jesus. <laughs> if ever anyone could have said that. Look at all the encounters that Jesus had with people. I'm not going to get you to raise your hand, but oftentimes in the flesh, this is what you and I would like to do. Don't raise your hand. But, you know, if someone dropped some, some money and some acreage into our lives, Lord, let me get up to the mountaintop. Just give me about 10 acres let me be free of all the hassles, of all the people, of all the problems, of everything else, and I'll just live by myself. Don't raise your hand if that's you, but I know it's a lot of us, and I know those thoughts run through our minds from time to time. But God says, I've put you where I've put you. I've planted you where I've planted you, that you might be a witness to the nations and to the world. And so I want to do a pruning in you that you might bear fruit, and that you might bear more fruit as he says there in verse 2. And so the Lord is doing this work, and it is a process. And we don't like it all the time any more than the branches, if they were alive in the same way we I'm sure if they had mouths and could speak as the pruning is going on. Ouch! Ow! What are you doing? Oh, no, no! We have to trust that the husbandman knows what he's doing. The farmer knows what he's doing. 
He's cultivating the tree. He knows better than we do. If you leave it up to the branch, the branch is going to say, don't you ever touch me. Let me grow like I'm growing. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. And the Lord says, no, this situation has to change. Snip. No, this over here. No, no, I'm not. I love you too much. This is going to keep you from bearing fruit. Snip. I wonder why my friend just suddenly stopped calling me. Because it's your unsaved friend. It's your ungodly friend that's going to bring you down. And God loves you so much that sometimes he'll come in and remove the situation for you. Sometimes God will deal with things in your life because you're not willing to deal with them yourself. That's the pruning process. He loves us so much. He will oftentimes intervene. How many are thankful that God intervenes sometimes? Because, if it's again, if it's left up to us, nah, just let me do what I want to do. No, God wants us to bear fruit. So there's that process of pruning. Very quickly, there's a purpose in pruning. Number one, as I said earlier, or I alluded to, you know, pruning is actually positive. It's not a negative. From our angle, we think it of as, an, as a negative, but it's actually a positive. He has a purpose for everything that he's doing in our lives. And if you don't know the answer and you say, God, why, why, why? And that's the, that's the question we all ask. Come on, every time there are problems, every time there are great, we're on the, the sea and the storm is raging and we say, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. What's going on? I didn't cause this storm to come up. I, I wasn't looking for this. I'm just minding my own business. And all of a sudden, here I'm in the midst of this huge storm and then we always want to ask, why God? Why God? Why God? I was reminded as I was going through Job recently again. And I remind you, God never told Job the whys. He never, and he didn't owe it to Job. In fact, after Job and all of his friends got through with their complaining and their, uh, all their smart ideas, so-called, and why things were happening the way they were, and Job's friends were just as horrible, and uh, if not more so than Job in many ways. But at the end of it all, God says, basically, Job, did you create me or did I create you? Do I really owe you an explanation? You're the creator. I don't owe you an explanation. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm the righteous judge. I'll, I'll do as I see fit. You didn't create these uh, sea animals and all these large animals that roam the earth and do this. And that. You didn't do any of that. That's me, and I'll do what I want to. Even though you and I get an inside story and know that Satan had come and had, had petitioned God to let his hand off of Job and all that, but he never tells Job that at the end of the book. After God says, basically, I'm God, Job then has to say, you're right. And that's, that's all we can do is say, you're right. I don't know why, God, but you're doing what you're doing. And pruning is a positive. And this is how we know. If you don't, if you don't have an answer to the why in your life, would you please plug in to Romans 8.28 and leave it there? Plug into Romans 8.28 and leave it there. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. He doesn't explain how and why and all those things, but we know because of his character and his nature, God loves us, he will be good to us, he will cause all these things to work together for good. Even those things that Satan says, I mean for evil, God says, oh, I'm so much bigger than you. You're a created being as well. I'm going to turn it around for good. Watch and see. The chess game is already over before it starts. God is sovereign. And so pruning is a positive in our life, and nothing happens by, by just luck or happenstance. Things don't work that way for the child of God. God is in control of our life. He loves you. He's working his best in your life. Pruning is also powerful because God always achieves his ways in this world. God's going to have the final say in everything. And so we're given the option to cooperate with him. His pruning is a powerful process. And you and I are just called to cooperate with him. And the more we accept his working, the more it accomplishes, and the quicker, by the way, that it's over. Sometimes God is doing, working on that same little part of the branch over and over and over. And, and, and he says, just let me do it. Just let me take the snip here. Boom, it's done. Start growing. No, God, no. And we hold on and hold on to something that God says, no, let it go. Let it go. Pruning is also productive, of course, because the fruit of the pruning is really internal in our hearts and in our lives. Hebrews 12, 11, 
No discipline seems to be joyful for the present. It seems painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we don't like it when we're being pruned, but God says, oh, but it's going to bring about something so joyous and wonderful. Peace is going to flood your soul, folks. We have people that have no peace in their hearts right now, and God says, you want peace? Let me do the pruning in your life. Quit fighting me. Let me accomplish my work in your heart and in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. Are you still with me? Yes. Are you being pruned right now? So you're not, but that's okay. The Lord wants to do this work. Pruning is, of course, necessary in producing the fruit. That's, how, that's why it's productive. Pruning contributes to that productivity in our lives and in our work for the Lord. And I want you to notice the progression here in John 15. In verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear what? More fruit. And then if you jump up to verse 5, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Fruit. More fruit. Much fruit. We need believers today that will allow God to prune them, that they might be productive for his glory and for his honor and bear much fruit for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. And then real quickly, I've just got to touch on this. The problems with pruning, and it's not a problem from God's angle, but what I mean by that is mistakes that we make in regards to what we think about pruning. So there, there, there are problems in pruning, but it's from our end because we have wrong thoughts and wrong ideas about it. And so I want to share these with you. Number one, we oftentimes think that pruning is punishment. God is just punishing me. Lightning bolt after lightning bolt. Boy, he's just sitting up there and he's just zapping me again and again and again. Seriously. God's pruning process is not punishment. God loves us. There is a difference between discipline, which can involve sometimes what we call punishment, but there's a difference in the mindset and the attitude of it. We think of punishment as something bad. God, is he just doesn't like me. He's doing something bad. But the author of Hebrews says, no, it's discipline that is meant for our good. But oftentimes we think of pruning as punishment. And yet Hebrews 12 makes it clear that that's not the case. Listen to me, folk. Anytime you think God's pruning is punishment, I want you to remember the cross. Jesus took the punishment. He took the wrath of God on himself for us. God is not looking to pour his wrath out on you. In that sense, he is not looking to punish you. And don't get caught up on the word, but you know what I mean. Is he looking to discipline us that we might grow? Absolutely. And, and I'm, the, I'm the type of child that I want God. If I've got the fork in my hand and want to go over here and plug it into the outlet to see what happens, I want God to say, uh, no, no, no. And pull me away and discipline me. Don't you? I, want God, I don't want God to say to be that passive parent. The parent that now that's all in vogue. The friend. I'm going to be my kid's friend. And let them do whatever they want. That's the best kind of parent. Because they'll always love me. I just tell them yeah for everything. Can I go play in the street? Absolutely. If that makes you happy. I was talking with someone to, uh, just this week about... And that they had heard from um, someone else that how they were raising up their little kids. And they went to hug their child, three-year-old, and then pulled back real quick. The child said, you didn't ask me if you could hug me. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Oh, you're right. I have to. That's right. What in the world? <laughs> I want a heavenly father. That loves me. And by the way, the Hebrews 12 passage ends up saying, if you're not being disciplined, it means you're not one of his. You're not even one, you're an illegitimate child. Because legitimate children that God loves, just like these branches, he will prune and he will discipline and he will help us to grow into the image of him. But don't think of pruning as punishment. Real quick. Number two, sometimes we think pruning is permanent. This is just the way it's always going to be. God is working on me and dealing with me and just cutting here and cutting there. And man, it's just, just it's never ending. 
Well, in one sense, yeah, God is always, every season that the tree comes back, you want to look at it and make sure, can it bear more fruit? Can it grow some more? So there is that, but we think of pruning specific instances as being just a permanent thing. Oh, the branch is never going to grow again. It's, it's, the loss is permanent. Um, it, it's, it's just never, we're never going to get anywhere. No, listen to me. God does the pruning so that more fruit can be produced. And there is an end to pruning. And if there's not, the plant's destroyed, and God knows that. So God, you know, some people, they can't have plants because they go out and they start to prune, and they're like the um, hairdresser that, you know, one little child, oh, oh, now this side's not even, a little bit more here. Oh, no, now this side, you know, like the, the guy at Christmas time with the Christmas, oh, let me just sh shave off a couple of branches. It's not quite balanced here. And, oh, no, I got it. And before you know it, there's nothing left. Okay, God doesn't do that. He loves us, all right? He is pruning us and working on us, and there will come a, a place where he says, okay, now that work is accomplished, and we continue to bear fruit for him. Amen? God's intention is never to keep pruning you to the point where you die. That's not his point at all. He wants you to live and to grow in him. And then the last thing I want to say in terms of mistakes regarding pruning, we often think that pruning is passive. It's just really this mild passive thing. But no, God prunes out the dead branches, number one. So that's a, that's a radical thing. He cuts those off. It's not passive at all. But number two, within that also, God prunes the living branches. He cuts back something so that we can be more productive. And the problem comes that we refuse at times to accept what he's doing, and that causes us to miss productivity, or it could be even worse if we continue to harden our heart. Can I just tell you, God is calling out to each and every one of us. He's calling out, grow. Let 2023 be a year where you grow and receive the loving, pruning work of the Lord in your life that you might bear more fruit. I'm never coming back to that church again. That pastor keeps just popping me every time. He's just, you know, throwing all this at me. Receive it as the Lord because I'm not here shooting at anyone. I can promise you that before God. But I hope that the Lord every once in a while is direct with me. I want him to be direct with me. And he is direct with us in his word. Amen. He wants us to grow in him. Folk, as we get ready to close, I ask Sister Beverly if she wouldn't mind coming back up. Here's what we read in, in John 15 about this thing of being pruned, about being cleansed. Jesus says you're cleansed because of the word spoken to me. And I, uh, this was not an expository message. This was a topical message today. So I didn't go through all those verses and talk about that. But here's what we learn. We either allow ourselves to be pruned and cleansed by the Lord when he's speaking to us, when he's, when he's through circumstances, people, whatever it might be, when he's doing that work, we either allow ourselves to be pruned, we allow ourselves to be cleansed by him, or the other option is we're cut off. I can't be more serious than that with you. I do not see a third option anywhere in there in John 15. It's either you are in Christ and you have the life of Christ, or you are on the outside, you have been cut off, you're outside, you no longer have the life of Christ. There is no in-between, there is no purgatory, there is nothing of that nature, either in the next life or even in this life, of I can just walk the fence. I just keep kind of, I know God and I'm here with God, but I also like the things that I like, and I know God is trying to prune me, but nah. I'm just going to keep doing my own thing and it'll be all right. At the end, I'll accept him. Problem is you don't know when the end may come. You don't know when the cutoff point, no pun intended, may transpire. We're not promised tomorrow. We heard multiple testimonies this morning. God keeping people from horrific accidents that could take lives. We don't know. We've got to allow God to do the pruning right now. Maybe even today you came in and God has been speaking to your heart about something. And you know he's trying to prune you, but you've been resistant to it. My word to you today is don't resist any longer. Receive it with joy. Let the Lord do that work so that you can bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit for his kingdom. I can promise you this. 
There's no more miserable a life than the life of someone who knows the truth but refuses to walk in it. There's nothing worse. It's the most horrible thing anyone can, can be in. Well, I know that this is what God wants, but I, I, I just, I'm stubborn. I'm going to do my own thing. Whew. Miserable existence. God is the strong man in this one. You're not. <laughs> you know, you, you can't beat God. So give in. Let him have his way. I was never much for the arm wrestling, but we did it some in school. You know, if, you had, if there was somebody that you knew was going to win, that they just had more strength to keep pulling. Sometimes some of these guys, I saw them, they injured themselves. They can't win, but oh, I'm going to keep, oh, I'm just going to keep trying. And keep. That's the macho thing to do when it comes to God's kingdom. Forget macho. Forget all that stuff. Just let him take you over because it's for your good. He's pruning you because he loves you and he wants you to bear fruit for him. That's my desire for each and every one of us. And I close by saying to you, it's because we are attached to him. Through prayer, through the study of God's word, through the yielding to his spirit in our lives, every moment of every day, let's make the choice to say, Lord, you're in charge. You're in charge. Prune away. Prune away that I might bring glory and honor to you. Are you with me on that? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I ask today that you would just bring strength to your people. Lord, you are doing a work. There is a sifting that is going on in the visible church. Lord, there, there is some cutting of branches. Lord, our, our prayer is always as long as there's breath in someone, as long as they're alive, we pray for them. We pray that they could return. Lord, we didn't go to um, Romans chapter 11 and talk about the fact that you can graft back in. But you can certainly, you can do these things. But Lord, there is a sifting that is taking place. We live in a very wicked world. So many temptations and many are falling to various temptations. And ultimately, it's just the temptation to be outside of Christ in one way or another. Verbally, we may say, yes, I'm a believer. We may come to church. We may do all those things. But internally, we are not allowing your life to flow through us. So, Father, I pray, first of all, you would help us. Let us repent from that stubborn, willful, rebellious heart. And then, Lord, as your people, I pray that as we've been sifted, we would come through on the other side and we would begin to bear fruit for you. I know there are many that are in difficult situations today, Heavenly Father. Many have come in and they have broken hearts. They're hurting. And it's not because of things they have done. Oftentimes these are outside situations that are coming to bear on their life. But I pray in the name of Jesus, I pray for them today. Strengthen them. I pray each person here would find their life only in you, in Jesus Christ. He is Savior and Lord. Let us find our life in Jesus. Meet every need in this place. And as we walk out, let us walk out maybe with a, a different set of eyes that maybe instead of just looking at the circumstances, we're looking beyond that and we're seeing with eyes of eternity that there's an eternal work that's going on that you want to come to bear in our life where we could then turn around and bear this much, much fruit. Do this work in your people today, I pray, and we'll thank you and we'll honor you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. God is good.